Hi, everybody. This is Pete Irig, uh, teaching pastor at Island Community Church, and uh, this is going to be our part seven of our Island Connect series, The Life of Paul. Uh, again, we're trying to post this uh, every Wednesday for the duration as we're kind of social distancing. Hopefully, this will be of help. And uh, basically, uh, the goals and in, in overview, as I said last time, uh, were that everybody can get better at interpreting scripture. And so the goal of this series is not to give you a text, uh, text by text commentary of the, of the books of Paul, but really to give you the context of Paul's life, who he was, what we know about the context of his life and the, and the history and the geography of where these things were, were written and to whom they were written. And then also give you some context for the individual letters. So it'll help you with your further studies when you go to your small groups, you hear it on Sunday, uh, you do your own devotionals. Uh, this is really trying to give you some additional tools just to kind of bring the scripture to life, to put it in a, a kind of a, a real context that these were, Paul was a real person writing to real churches, struggling with various things. And uh, it has a lot of instruction for us. So again, I, this is just a, as a help to you and I hope you get something out of it. So uh, this is part seven. So if you haven't seen the first parts, I, I always like to recap what we've gone on so far and what we've gone over. And so, so far we've talked about uh, who Paul was as a person, uh, his biography. He was born in Tarsus, which is in Turkey today. It was Asia Minor uh, back then in about 5 BC. Uh, just to give you context, Christ was crucified in about 33 BC or 33 AD. So that kind of gives you some context. Uh, Paul's father was a Roman citizen, and we don't know exactly why. We think he did some good things for the Romans during their civil war with Julius Caesar, and he was bestowed Roman citizenship. And of course, Paul became an automatic Roman citizen when he was born because his father's a Roman citizen. That's a big deal. Not everybody. Uh, was a Roman citizen in the empire at that time. You had rights that uh, normal provincial people wouldn't have. Paul was educated as a Pharisee, uh, Pharisee being an ultra-Orthodox uh, Jewish uh, educated person who would have memorized the Torah inside and out and encouraged everybody to be uh, following the Torah completely. Um, as a Pharisee, as he went in his little career there um, in Jerusalem, he persecuted the Christians on behalf of the Pharisees, because the Pharisees considered Christians to be blaspheming Jews and wanted to rid them uh, out of Judea. So, uh, and of course, he had the road to Damascus experience. He, he encountered the risen Christ and was converted. Um, he went on three missionary journeys as an apostle to the Gentiles. And of course he started with the Jews everywhere he went, went to the synagogues and preached the gospel. Uh, but, uh, you know, really also spread this as a main thing to the Gentiles throughout the Roman empire and planted many churches, uh, went back to Jerusalem, uh, and, uh, got, uh, accosted by a mob. The Romans arrested him, found out he was a citizen, put him under house arrest for two years. Uh, Paul claimed uh, the right as a Roman citizen to be tried in Rome, and they shipped him to Rome, and uh, he was caught up in the first persecution by the Emperor Nero of, of Christians, and was executed in about 66 AD, we think. And again, these, these dates are all kind of approximate. We don't have the exact date, but this is what we can piece together. So as a Roman, citizen paul at the height of the empire he was he was a roman from the provinces which was unique because most of all the citizens were in rome or in italy not in the provinces and so that was a, a very important point for him in his ministry in his life especially toward the ends of it uh, end of it um then we talked about paul as a jew and we we and we talked that the the jews what they said they made them special apart from all the other peoples in the world were that they had, God gave them the Torah, the five books of Moses, uh, the temple where God uh, resided on earth and where you could actually um, put the sacrifices to him on holy ground. And then they had the land, the land that God gave them. And so this, uh, this period where Paul was living was uh, from that perspective called second temple Judaism because the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians and then rebuilt. So this is the second temple. And we talked about how in Judea, 
And during the second, second temple Judaism era, there were a lot of different groups. There was the Sadducees who kind of controlled the temple and collaborated with the Romans. There were the Pharisees who were the ultra Orthodox Jews. There were the Zealots who didn't want to wait for a Messiah. They wanted to overthrow the Romans now and start killing people. Um, the Essenes were kind of a mystic sect of Jews that retreated into the desert. And that's where we got the Dead Sea Scrolls from. And then the, the, the Aspera Jews or the Hellenized Jews, these were the Jews that lived all around the Roman Empire and that, that spoke Greek mostly as a first language. Um, and then you had the, the majority of the Jewish peasants in Judea who were not part of any of those groups and they were just trying to live their life. And Paul was trained as a Pharisee, and that was important because that gave him a lot of credibility as he started traveling around as an apostle uh, to all these towns and cities, because if he started in the synagogues, people would say, oh, you're a Pharisee from Jerusalem. You were trained as a Pharisee. They would listen to him initially, like, oh, you have a lot of credibility. Then we talked about Paul as an apostle, and he was you know, the apostle to the Gentiles. He was the, uh, the main engine of bringing the gospel to the non-Jewish world. Uh, but by doing that, you know, based on his style and his, uh, what the Spirit was telling him, uh, he basically con came into conflict with everybody he met. You know, he, the, he came in conflict with the Jews in the synagogues. He came in conflict with the pagans. Uh, he came in conflict with the Roman authorities. He came in conflict with people he called the Judaizers, the ones that were Christian teachers who were teaching people to, that you had to convert to Judaism if you're going to follow Jesus Christ. So everywhere he went, uh, he, he faced conflict, persecution, stonings, beatings, jailings, you name it. And we also talked, uh, then started talking, giving you some background about Paul's epistles or letters. Epistles is a fancy uh, Greek term for letter. Uh, Paul's epistles make up about a quarter of the New Testament. If you add in the 16 chapters of Luke, uh, of uh, Acts, then um, one third of the New Testament uh, is, is by or by Paul or about Paul. Most of these letters that he wrote are what we call occasional letters that we talked about. And, and what that means is that there was some reason he was writing the letter. Um, and we kind of talked about that over Romans Corinthians. The letter to Romans, I, I call the, the Mount Everest of letters in the New Testament because it's his longest. It's uh, where he lays out his gospel and he's very reasoned about it. He introduces himself to the Roman church because Peter had started uh, the Roman church. Paul had never been to Rome. He was about to, uh, he had plans to visit. He uh, also in Romans, the backdrop we talked about was a, a division and tension within the Roman church between the Gentile cr Christians and the Jewish Christians because of the Emperor Claudius kicking out the Jews for two years and then they let him back. There was a whole tension between those two groups and so Paul knew that and so he addresses some of that uh, a lot in Rome in Romans and then he also probably lays the foundation for support you know monetary and spiritual support for his intended journey to Spain in the province of Spain to bring the gospel of Spain after he visited Rome we don't think he ever got there there's no evidence that that he did that uh, but that was probably another reason then we looked at the letter to the Corinthian church, the letter to Corinthians, and this, uh, this is where he is, becomes more uh, pointed and practical in terms of what are you doing day to day, because there were a whole bunch of issues that the Corinthian church that he started, this was his church, um, that Paul was trying to address and give them practical guidance and spiritual guidance on these particular issues. So when we talked, about, and I, I described Romans in, in my term, when you think about Romans and you read Romans, this is the contemplative Paul. It's the Paul taking his time, really kind of laying out the arguments in a, in a very succinct but a, a very comprehensive way. Uh, first and second Corinthians is what I would call, you get a sense of the pastor Paul. You know, he's talking to the church that he founded, that he's still in contact with. He can't be there right now, but he knows there's problems. You know, here I'm going to, you know, as your pastor, as your founder, I'm going to give you some correction and some guidance. 
Now, Galatians is what we're going to look at uh, this time. And as I said before, Galatians is one of my personal favorites. And, and one of the reasons, I mean, they're all wonderful. They're all inspired by the Holy Spirit. And they're all endlessly deep wells that you can draw upon. But um, Galatians is the sense that I get is that this is Paul, the stern father. This is Paul, the crisis manager, because, again, the, the churches in Galatia, he started in, during his missionary journeys. We'll, we'll take a look at that in a second. Um, and, but he's, he's heard stuff that just set his hair on fire. It's like, what? You're doing what? And he fires off this fiery letter to them to try to make an immediate course correction. So it's, it's kind of like your stern father saying, stop what you're doing. This is wrong. What, don't you remember what I told you? And so the, it, you really get a sense of reading Galatians that Paul's like right next to you, pacing up and down, and, and he's dictating it to, the, uh, to his secretary, and he is just not holding back, right? He, he's concerned, he's angry, he's astonished. Uh, he's, he's trying his best to uh, open their eyes, and that's what we're going to look at. So uh, a little bit about Galatia. When we talked about uh, Corinthians, I said that uh, Corinthians, the letter to Corinthians, the, the context, uh, the, some of the important context for, for getting a sense of the background of Corinthians is the city of Corinth itself, the, the Las Vegas or boomtown of the... Uh, ancient world and and that would lead to certain pressures within the Corinthian church. Galatia is it's not that important to me in terms of the you know trying to do the interpretation of the letter for yourself. Galatia was kind of a backwater province you could see in this map it's it's uh, in the middle of Asia Minor kind of out in the, the boondocks uh, the the cities or towns that he mentions in his missionary journeys, the ones that we know about, like Lystra, Derbe, and Pisidian, Antioch, these are not major cities. You would probably call them, you know, towns. <laughs> They're 10,000 people maybe or, or less. Uh, we don't know how many churches he planted there, but we, we he's named a couple of them. Um, so it, I just wanted to give you a sense of where Galatia was. Um, and then if we talk about Paul and Galatia, you know, he visited the area of Galatia during his first missionary journey and established a number of churches. How many? We don't know. By the time he writes this letter to the churches in Galatian, Galatia, uh, who knows? It could have been 10, 15 uh, home churches or towns that have churches in them. We just don't know. Uh, the book of Acts does mention Pisidian, Antioch, Lystra, and Derbe as the you know, towns and cities he visited, but again, they weren't, even in the ancient Roman world, they weren't huge cities. Uh, most scholars say that the letter of Galatians is an early letter. It's written somewhere around 40 AD. There's a whole bunch of scholarly discussion about whether it was written to the northern Galatian churches or the southern Galatian churches, and what's the time frame doesn't really matter too much for, for the normal person trying to interpret uh, the letter. The occasion of the letter is, is pretty clear, all right? So if you look in Acts 14, 13 and 14, uh, it relates that Paul and Barnabas evangelized in Galatia, that region, and started, of course, as usual, Paul starts in the synagogues. But uh, by this time, most of the churches in the Galatia region, we think, were mostly Gentile Christians because you didn't have large cities in Galatia, so you didn't have large populations of diaspora Jews. There were some, obviously there were some synagogues, but as you, when you think about Corinth and Athens and Ephesus and Rome, you'd have really big Jewish populations uh, com compared to the backwater of Galatia. So by the time these churches were, be, were being started and most of the people were probably Gentile converts, you know, pagan converts. Now, what has happened here, and, and Paul tells us in the letter of Galatia, or we, we can, again, we're hearing one side of the telephone conversation, but he's pretty clear on this, is that some Jewish Christians, these were Christians that were converted from Judaism and were teachers, he calls them Judaizers, came in Paul's wake and taught that the, the Gentile Christians that were there, part of the churches that Paul uh, created, 
they needed to submit to the Mosaic law, the Torah, just like the Jews did. They had to follow all the rituals. They had to follow all that stuff. If you're going to follow Christ, you basically had to become a Jew if you weren't a Jew. And if you were a Jew, you had to follow just like the regular Jews did the, the Torah. And uh, Paul had to fight against this and it's alluded to in Romans and, and practically everything else he does about these false teachers, these Judaizers, like it just drives him nuts because everywhere he goes after he leaves, someone's floating through from Jerusalem or somewhere else saying, oh yeah, well, Paul didn't tell you the whole thing or I think he's mistaken on this point. You really do need to convert to Judaism. Um, so Paul says that these false teachers, he calls them also false teachers, questions, question Paul's authority to these believers. Like, oh, yeah, well, Paul, you know, I think he's mistaken on some of that stuff. And, you know, I, uh, even the people in Jerusalem are thinking that maybe Paul's off base here. And Paul insists upon his apostolic authority. Um, those Judaizers insisted that the Gentile Christians in Galatia get circumcised. If you're not circumcised, you better be circumcised. You better see, keep the Sabbath. You better keep the dietary laws and, and all that stuff, just like a regular Jew would. So that is the kind of occasion of the letter. Somehow Paul heard this was going on. They heard that these people were, were floating through Galatia and telling the church, uh, the, the early churches that Paul had started this stuff. And Paul immediately fired off this letter. So Paul's writing to immediately correct the situation. Um, and to just give you a sense of, of how urgent this letter is, in the ancient world, you know, the epistles had a usual um, format. You, you would have an introduction or a greeting, you know, from, this is from Petros to Dionysus, you know, you know, and then you'd have a body of what you wanted to say, and then you have a closing. And Paul, usually in his letters, also puts a, right after the introduction or the address, if you will, a thanksgiving prayer. Uh, you know, I, I always give thanks for you to God, for, for all the faithful people in Corinth, whatever. In Galatians, he skips the thanksgiving greeting. So you can imagine these little churches in Galatians get, you know, we get a letter from Paul, oh, this is great. And so somebody in the, court, in the congregation in the little home church gets up, starts reading slowly this letter because these letters were not meant to be read. They were meant to be heard because very only maybe 10% of people in the ancient world could, could read or write. And so you'd have somebody who was skilled in being able to read the writing and, and say it to the congregation. So he'd start off, all right, hey, this is from Paul. And then there's no Thanksgiving gear. And he goes right into, what are you doing? You know, here's my authority. Here's what's going on. And it would be a very abrupt, wow, ooh, are we in trouble? What's the matter here? That I've never heard Paul say something like this. So by him skipping that Thanksgiving prayer right after the introduction shows uh, the mood he's in, right? He's really trying to shake them up. So I want to spend the majority of the rest of our time just giving you the context, if you will, behind the letter. You know, what is this issue that, that this letter is addressing? And so the first thing I just want to go over just as a, as a review, I have said it last time, say it again this time. The Jews themselves thought they were special. They were chosen people. So God chose them and God gave them three things that made them special. One is they gave them the temple. You know, obviously, the temple was built in Jerusalem, uh, but that was the place of the Holy of Holies. And, and of course, it was destroyed by the Babylonians, but rebuilt. Um, and so the, the temple was special. Uh, God also gave them the land, the land of Canaan. You know, they, they, and so uh, um, the, the tribes of Israel took over Canaan and became Israel and, and the land was special for them. And then, of course, God gave them the Torah through Moses, right? the five books of Moses. It was just how to live. Who, you know, who is God? What is my relationship to God? How do I become a righteous person in this chosen people? How do I follow what God wants me to follow? Now, out of those three, the, they still had the temple, although the Sadducees were in cahoots with the Romans. So people were like, oh, this doesn't feel right. 
And of course, they didn't have a land. They had a land. They were living in a land, but the Romans were ruling it, these pagans. And before the Romans, it was the Greeks. And before the Greeks, it was the Persians. And before the Persians, it was the Babylonians. You know, so, you know, we're, we're in trouble here. How do we get the land back? How do we, how do we restore this? Well, they were waiting for a Messiah that would come and kick all the pagans out. And then the third part is, is the Torah. We have the law. And of course, the Pharisees would say, if you can follow the Torah and all of the laws in there closely, then the Messiah will come and then put everything right. So to the Pharisees and to many of the Jews at the time, it was really about how closely could you follow all the commandments in the Torah. So the context here, the broad context of Galatians is really about the, the law and, and the, the relationship of the law to Christians and, and salvation. And so if you look at the Abrahamic covenant, the, the covenant God made with Abraham and sets Abraham's descendants apart, the chosen people. And so in Genesis 12, uh, one through three, uh, it says, the Lord had said to Abram, which was Abraham's name before he was faithful, um, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So there is a covenant between God and Abraham and that creates a chosen people and through that chosen people, somehow the world will be put to right. And now fast forward a little bit, you have a nation of the tribes of Israel, a uh, descendant from Abraham and uh, Moses gets from God the, uh, the five books of the Bible, first five books, which is the Torah. Uh, the Jews call that still today, the Torah. The Torah is Hebrew for law. So it's the law of Moses, the Mosaic law, the Torah. Um, in Leviticus 26, 46, uh, it says, these are the decrees, the laws, and the regulations that the Lord established at Mount Sinai between himself and the Israelites through Moses. So this was given by God through Moses to the people of Israel to live by the law. So as we look at that, um, there are multiple parts of this law. And this is all context for Galatians and obviously Romans and much else in the New Testament. But I think this is important to give you the context behind Galatians. So according to Judaism at the time, and even now for ultra-Orthodox Jews, the Torah doesn't just contain the Ten Commandments. It does contain the Ten Commandments. But if you look at um, you know, Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Exodus and, and all those books, and you tease out all the do this and don't do that, those are commands. Those are commands from God through Moses to Israel, and you're supposed to follow it. And they tallied up that there were 613 of these commands, or what they would call mitzvot, which is Hebrew for command or commandments, um, that you must follow. So there's 613 of these. In order for you to follow the Torah to the letter, there's 613 of these things that, that you have to follow. Um, now, when you look at the 613, typically most commentators, and it's what I do, is I, I split into three parts of the law. There's the moral law. This is how do you relate to God and how do you relate to each other through God, right? How do you treat each other? So in Exodus 20, one through three is an example. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no gods before me, all right? That, that's, that's a moral uh, or like in Leviticus uh, 1918, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. That is a moral law commandment that God is giving through Moses to Israel saying, here's how you're supposed to act with each other. And here's how you're at, supposed to act with me, you know, your, your Lord. And so there's a whole set of those. Obviously, Ten Commandments are the most famous uh, that everybody knows, but there's lots of other ones in there as well. The second big division would be what would be called civil law. In, in our terms today, it would be your, your statutory law of how society operates. You know, what happens if somebody does something wrong? 
what happens if you're in conflict with somebody from a legal standpoint. So for example, here in Deuteronomy 23, it says, do not charge a fellow Israelite interest, whether on money or food or anything else that may earn interest. You may charge a foreigner interest, but not a fellow Israelite. That is, kind of, that is a civil law. That is like how you operate the society. The th and there's a number of those. Um, the third one, which is a, a big part of the Mosaic law, is what would be called ceremonial. And it has to do with ritual purity because what God put in front of Israel and Moses saying, I'm a holy God. And in order to, uh, for you, a pagan society that I'm taking out of this pagan world and, and teaching you how to be God's people, I need you to always think about purity and, and I can't stand sin and I can't stand impurity. So in order to uh, do this sacrificial system, because you had to have a sacrificial system for the ancient Israelites, because there was probably, there's no way they could follow all 100, 613 mitzvahs every day. They're going to break one. And if you break one, one of these 613 laws, you have broken the entire law of the Torah. Uh, and so how do you get back in God's good graces when you have committed a sin against his law? Well, there was a, a sacrificial system that, that was set up. Uh, God uh, instructed them saying that, you know, on certain festivals and certain types of people like priests, they could make atonement sacrifices and which would uh, do individual atonement for people who were sin sinners. And then sometimes there were atonements for the entire nation of Israel. But in order to do those, uh, those rites and sacrifices, you had to be in a state of ritual purity. And there are a lot of rules about, you know, what's pure, what's impure, what would make you impure, which would, uh, and how, do, if you become impure, how do you become pure again? There's bathing and, uh, and time um, that you have to spend apart from people. And, uh, you know, like in Leviticus uh, 15, 19, it says, when a woman has her regular flow of blood, the impurity of her monthly period will last seven days. And anyone who touches her will be unclean till evening. What that means is that that impurity can be put to other people. So if you touch that woman, you were a priest, you were now unclean. You couldn't do any sacrifices until that evening. And then there were all these other rituals that you had to do. So, you know, these three parts, moral, civil, ceremonial, 613 commandments in total, as the Jews would say. Uh, so to put it in context for the Jews, the Torah was what set them apart from the rest of the world and determined who was a good or righteous Jew and who wasn't. It didn't determine whether you were a Jew or not or whether you were saved or not. You were born a Jew. The question for them was, are you a righteous Jew? Are you righteous in God's eyes, i.e., are you a good Jew? Are you, are you, would God be pleased with you? At this time in the Old Testament, uh, and even in Judaism today, there's a whole range of, of thought about, is there an afterlife and, you know, how, what does that have to do with following the Torah? Uh, Judaism isn't built like Christianity like that. Um, so this was really a matter of who is inside the club. You know, if you're a Jew, you were probably born a Jew, you could convert to be a Jew, but in order to convert to be a Jew, you had to follow all these rules, which part of them, you had to do things like, you had to be circumcised. It didn't matter how old you were. If you're a 30 year convert to a 30 year old and you're converting to Judaism, you would have to get circumcised. And then you would have to stay away from Gentiles. You would have to keep the dietary laws. You would have to do all the festivals. You'd have to participate in the ceremonial things and the civil things. So it was a big deal for the Jews to say, you know, I follow the Torah. So the question, you know, really comes down in Galatians and the background to it is what are the Judaizers saying in the churches, you know, when Paul's not there and they come visit the church and they say, hey, I'm from Jerusalem and I'm a teacher, I'm a Christian teacher. Oh, let me tell you what this is about. So, so Paul himself, of course, advocated that the gospel was for everyone, not just the Jews. And uh, in Galatians, he, he actually describes a time where he mixed it up with Peter in Antioch uh, and called the, the conflict with Peter in Antioch. So in Galatians 
2, 11, 14, he, he relates, he says, when Cephas, which is the Aramaic name for Peter, came to Antioch, which is up in Syria, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But what, that is the, the Gentiles and the Gentile Christians. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. So he used to eat with the Gentile Christians, but then for some reason, other people came from Jerusalem. He got a little antsy about it. So he started just segregating himself and eating with just the Jewish Christians because they belong to the circumcision group, meaning the Jews. The other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? So he was calling Peter out saying, you can't, we are all one in Christ. There's no, those laws don't apply anymore. Now, you know, they had, uh, this all came to a head in Jerusalem. They had what's called the Jerusalem Council with all the apostles there. And Paul and Barnabas made the case like the gospels for the Gentiles. They don't have to convert to Judaism. Uh, and it was settled, right? Well, it should have been settled as it's described in Acts 15. However, throughout Paul's ministry, there's, there's sometimes explicit things like in Galatians or sometimes implicit uh, mentionings in other letters where he was constantly fighting a rear guard action against other Christian teachers that would float into town behind him and start telling the new Christians, if they were Gentiles, hey, you have to follow the Torah. To be a true faithful follower of Jesus, you've got you've to be a Jew. And if you're not a Jew now, you got to convert. And so the basic question that the questions that this uh, puts forth is, do you have to follow the law to be uh, the law of Moses to be a follower of Jesus? All of it, all 613 mitzvahs. And then really what you're saying behind that is, does your salvation depend on following these laws? Meaning, if you can't really be a true follower of Jesus, if you're not following the 613 mitzvah, if you're not doing the ceremonial stuff and the circumcision and stuff, and that kind of makes you not a very good Christian or not really a follower of Jesus yet, does that mean that in order for me to be have salvation, eternal salvation, I have to do something. I've got to follow this law. i got to get circumcised. i got to do, follow these festivals. i got to do this stuff in order for me to have that salvation in Jesus? That was the basic question. And of course, we, we kind of know what Paul's answer is. If you've heard anything about Paul, you know his answers. And that's really the crux of what he is trying to address. That's the occasion of this letter. So Paul's view of the law, his core message here is, is multifold. He says that, you know, the followers of Christ are not under the law, but are justified by their belief in Jesus Christ, all right? You're not justified by the law. You're justified by Jesus Christ, by your belief in him that he is who he said he was. He is the son of God. He, 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 he rose, he paid for our sins, and he will give us eternal life if we believe in his name and who he said he was. So in Galatians, uh, in uh, Galatians 2, he writes, um, we who are Jews by birth are and are not sinful Gentiles know that the person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by doing works of the law, no one will be justified. Remember, this is Paul writing to the Galatians, probably converted pagans, Gentile Christians, and he's saying it's the faith in Christ. It's not these works of the Mosaic law or by you doing any kind of formulas other than belief in Jesus Christ. Uh, no one can be saved by that law by trying to follow the 613 mitzvah. And, he, and they would know that Paul was a Pharisee. He used to live like that. Um, so... Then he also goes on to say that the law is a curse. 
It's actually a curse and a burden. And in Galatians 3, he says, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, as is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. What that means is if you break one of those 613 mitzvahs, no matter how small or in, in, inconsequential you might think it is, you have broken the entire law. You are lost. You're cursed. And he, he actually says, he's like, I know I was a Pharisee and I couldn't follow the law. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I, I, I was trying to do it, but I, I couldn't do it. If I couldn't do it, how are you going to do it? Why would you even take that on your shoulders? I don't understand it, you people in Galatia. Don't you remember what I taught you? This is his basic message. He also describes the law as what I would call a guardrail for a young Israel, right? An ancient Israel that was carved out of an incredible, uh, violent and, and immoral pagan world that had animal, you know, human sacrifice and incest and a whole bunch of other just horrible things. And God plucked this people out of history and through that was going to teach the world uh, how to live the way God meant you to live. And so the law taught Israel and then taught the world what sin is. Like, this is how you are meant to live. This is how you're meant to be in a relationship with me, a holy God. This is how you're supposed to be in a relationship with each other. And so this guardrail for Israel was up until the coming of Christ. It was a precursor for the actual solution, which is the coming of Jesus Christ. So in Galatians 3, he says, why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed, or Jesus, to whom the promise referred had come. So it was the kind of the babysitting guardrail for a, a very, very ancient people until the true, the true solution came, which was always planned, which was Jesus Christ. God himself was coming down. And Jesus said, he will fulfill, he has fulfilled the law. All right, so the, the law is fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Paul says the rituals and observances in the Mosaic law mean nothing now. So in, toward the end of the letter in Galatians 6, he says neither circumcision or uncircumcision means anything. What counts now is new creation, meaning what counts now is that you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. When you have confessed in your heart that Jesus is the Savior, that, that he is the Son of God, that he was risen and broke the power of death, you are now a new person. You have regenerated. The Holy Spirit has come upon you. You're not the old man. The old man's dead. You're a new creation. That's what counts. It doesn't matter whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised. It doesn't mean anything now because of Jesus. So his main point is that Christ fulfilled the law. He didn't come to say, oh, the law's stupid. You know, it doesn't matter anymore. No, Christ fulfilled it. And belief in Jesus Christ means freedom for everyone who believes in him. Freedom from the law, freedom from that curse, freedom from the burden. You can't be good enough to follow all of that. And Jesus becomes the sacrificial system. There's no need to, to sacrifice pigeons and goats and oxen anymore because Jesus made the one and only sacrifice that matters for all time himself. And we all participate that through belief in him. That is the underlying context of Galatians and what he's trying to uh, address. I wanted to kind of um, end this by talking about the very end of Galatians was very interesting, right? So if you look at Galatians 6, 11 through 15, he writes, See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of the Christ, for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is new creation. And that's his, like, his, his last plea to them. But it's interesting, I, I cut and paste a, 
an example of an ancient uh, papyrus document or letter from that time. This isn't Paul's letter, but it kind of give you a visual as, as, as the reader in the small congregations, home churches in Galatia are reading this, the reader would get to the very end and then he, he'd read out, see what large letters I used to write to you with my own hand. And he'd like, and he'd probably turn the papyrus around and show everybody. And it would look like, you know, uh, the majority of letter was neat, uh, orderly, spaced out, professional scribe Greek. And then it would be chicken scratch at the end because Paul was educated, but he wasn't a professional scribe. And then he's already kind of on fire. So he's actually writing this with his own handwriting because before he was just, he was uh, dictating it to a secretary. And he takes the, the, the quill and he takes the papyrus and he, start, he scratches out the end of Galatians in his own hands to make the point that this is something that is so important. I'm writing this myself. And I think that's a very interesting visual. Imagine what you, you would feel like with, with not the Thanksgiving prayer being omitted up front. And then the end of it is Paul is actually writing this himself in this last paragraph. So it really tries to, to impress upon the point of how serious this is to Paul and how he wanted to intervene with the church, churches in Galatia that, that he started. So that was trying to give you kind of a backdrop, a context for the letter of Galatians. And Galatians is something, again, it's a deep well that you can be in forever. Uh, every, every line drips with incredible inspiration and, and teaching and something to ponder on and, and that's what you will do in your bible studies and what you'll hear on sundays what i want to do is give you a context so as you're doing that yourself you can kind of keep some of this in, in the back of your mind so as a recap we said paul's most important figure in, in the apostolic age probably because he has uh, made the gentile church in, in the roman empire for a large large degree uh, through his evangelism uh, he wrote a large part of the New Testament that we have, uh, the most important theolog theologian in the early church, uh, his description of salvation, his description of the gospel is foundational to Christianity. Uh, Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles, he had to deal with these Judaizers and false teachers that kept coming behind him throughout his, uh, his ministry. And his epistles are foundational for Christian theology. And uh, so I hope this was something that, uh, you enjoyed. Uh, um, if you have any questions, feel free to drop me an email. Uh, it's uh, P I R I G Keys and P I H R I G K E Y S at gmail.com. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to drop me a note. Uh, if you have any questions for my cat Pelly, I know other people have been asking. Uh, you can use that same email. It just might take him longer to get back to you because he doesn't have opposable thumbs and it takes him longer to type, but he's a pretty smart cat not around Paul, but if you have cat questions. Um, anyway, I hope uh, that you're all safe, that you're all uh, uh, spending this time with loved ones and keeping in touch with each other. I pray uh, uh, for your safety, for your, for your well-being, but uh, we have peace in our faith and in God and in Jesus Christ, and we need to keep our eyes there. And until next week, I'll talk to you on the internet. Bye.